Good evening, everyone. Hello, how are you? Um, this is actually my first time at an Ethereum meetup. I've been uh, interested and involved in Ethereum uh, since the very beginning, actually since two weeks before the very beginning because Vitalik sent me the white paper and um, he asked me for comments. So I, I promptly uh, called him, told him exactly why uh, it wouldn't work. <laughs> and then he explained to me why I was wrong. And as is usually the case with Vitalik, he has this very annoying tendency of being right. <laughs> so, so I got really excited about Ethereum and I've been involved since then. Um, before we get started, uh, this is my new book, The Internet of Money. It was published 10 days ago. Um, my first book is Mastering Bitcoin. And it is a book about how Bitcoin works and how blockchains work in general. Uh, this book is a collection of my talks and it's about why this technology matters. And you know, most of the ideas apply very much to any open, public, decentralized, borderless, permissionless blockchain, whether that's Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of the other several hundred uh, systems that exist out there. If you're at all interested, I have a few copies with me. I'll be uh, selling them after the event and signing them if you want. All right, so let's get started. The title of this talk is The Lion and the Shark. Some people have called me a Bitcoin maximalist. I am not a Bitcoin maximalist. Um, I'm interested in the possibility of open, public, borderless, decentralized, permissionless blockchains and disrupting everything. And in that space, I think there is plenty of space for many different approaches to many different problems. So the first question you have to ask is, well, what is Ethereum? And perhaps, what is Bitcoin? And how do the two compare? So, let's see what Google has to say. So I type into Google, Ethereum is, and Google suggests, as the first search, Ethereum is dead. <laughs> now, the good news is, Ethereum is not alone in that, because if you type Bitcoin is, Google suggests Bitcoin is dead. <laughs> So already we see that these two systems share one thing in common. <laughs> they are consistently underestimated. I call them zombie currencies. Even after the double tap, as you're walking out of the supermarket you just looted during the zombie apocalypse, you hear a roar behind you, because as always the zombie refuses to die. If you actually do the search Ethereum is, you get the definition which is on the Ethereum website. And oh, now it's refreshed on me. Ethereum is a decentralized platform for applications that run exactly as programmed without any chance of fraud, censorship, or third-party interference. If you type in Bitcoin is you get the title of Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper that says, Bitcoin is a system of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And so now we have to ask, are these what they say they are? Is Ethereum, in fact, what it says on the website? Is Bitcoin what it says in the white paper? And by asking that question, we have to look at the inescapable conclusion that what the founder wants something to be is not always what that thing is. And that shouldn't be surprising, because that applies to every technology. And the more disruptive it is, the less a founder or inventor is able to predict what it will end up being, 
how it will evolve, what fitness it will find for what applications. The Internet is a military network designed to allow the continuity of data routing in the case of a targeted strategic nuclear attack against the United States, or the world's single largest repository of cat videos. <laughs> DARPA did not set out to create the world's largest single repository of cat videos. Tim Berners-Lee designed the web to be a mechanism for physicists to be able to exchange knowledge, papers, data, and images between research institutions. Not to post photos of what they just ate, or to use just the right camera angle with just the right pouty duck face look to impress everyone in the world simultaneously. Unintended consequences are part of technology. Technology is a tool, and as a tool, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's dropped into a society, and society decides how every person uses that tool in a very decentralized manner. And as you use the tool, you change the tool. Your interaction with technology changes its nature. It molds to become what you want it to be. And that is true of centralized technologies. It is ten times as true of decentralized, open systems, where innovation does not require permission, where the development is guided by consensus in an open system. It is absolutely naive to assume that just because the founder thinks this is what it will be, that's what it will be. And it turns out that Ethereum is not a system of applications that run exactly as written, without third-party interference, censorship, etc. etc. And Bitcoin is not simply a system of peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. They evolve. And the tricky thing about evolution is, even when it's directed, when you make a choice on any feature of the system, you are constrained by two things. One, you have no idea what the marketplace, what society will do with that choice, and what path it will send you down. And more importantly, when you make that choice, you are always making a trade-off. If you choose one path, you close the possibility of pursuing other paths. If you are a shark and you have gills, you can breathe in salt water. But by necessity, you cannot breathe in open air. If you are a lion and you develop claws, you will not have the dexterity of primate fingers. Every choice opens one path and closes billions of other possibilities that could have been pursued. Even if you knew exactly where you are going, choices have consequences. They limit things. They are trade-offs. They are inherently trade-offs. And the reason I'm using the lion and the shark as an example is because I think that is one way to look at these systems of blockchains that we have, Ethereum and Bitcoin, when comparing them. If Ethereum is a shark, it is the apex predator within its own environment. It's a fast swimmer, it can breathe underwater, it eats anything that bothers it. If Bitcoin is a lion, it rules the land. But it doesn't swim very well. 
And you can never really put these two apex predators in a ring together and say, let the best one win. Because the outcome is decided entirely by whether you fill that fighting ring with water or not. Fitness for purpose is something that is decided through this evolutionary process in a marketplace. There is no such thing as best. In evolutionary terms, fitness does not mean the strongest. It means the one that has the best adaptation for its environment. And so then the question becomes, what is the environment for Ethereum? What is the environment for Bitcoin? What applications are the ones that are most suited to be solved with something like Ethereum? And what applications are the ones that are most suited to be solved by Bitcoin? Or any of the other systems out there? And necessarily, some choices have consequences. I'm not a maximalist, because I think maximalism is both counterproductive and hubris. It assumes that you have not just control over outcomes, but even the ability to foresee the outcome in the future. I can't make predictions about what's going to happen in this space three months out, because it changes too fast. So, what is Ethereum best suited for? Ethereum has made some very specific trade-offs, and these were not accidental, they were very deliberate. It is a Turing complete language, which offers enormous flexibility in programming, and brings Ethereum applications very close to the actual platform. Bitcoin is not Turing complete. And that's not an accident. It's not Turing complete for a very specific purpose. It's designed to be extremely limited in its flexibility in order to deliver very, very robust security. Because simplicity is a fundamental security practice. And if you choose to do things in a very simple way to make them very robustly secure, you necessarily close the door on billions of applications that we've never thought of that you do not have the flexibility to do. And if you choose to create the flexibility to do those applications, you're also signing up for a much more rapid pace of development, but also for much more complexity, which means many more bugs, many more unexpected conditions, many more unpredictable and unintended consequences. One necessitates the other. Ethereum maximalists will say, Ethereum can do everything that Bitcoin does. Comma, expect, except for robust security and sound money. And that's okay, because to make that choice to do sound money and robust security, you necessarily make it very difficult to build decentralized applications. Ethereum and Bitcoin have launched themselves on different paths. Those paths do not cross. Bitcoin cannot do many of the things that Ethereum does. Ethereum cannot do many of the things that Bitcoin does. But they can both do something miraculous. They can reorder the fundamental institutions of society around network-centric systems of organization instead of institutions. They can create opportunities for, permission without, uh, for innovation without permission. For anyone to construct applications where the minimum required market audience size is two. And that's it. If I have an app, and I have somebody else who wants to run that app, we have a network. On Ethereum or Bitcoin, we can run an application. 
We don't have to ask for anybody's permission. And that is a magical thing. It's an amazing thing. And what it's doing in both cases is creating this exponential explosion of innovation that we've never seen. And it's going to affect some societal institutions and structures that have remained unchanged since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that is the unique promise. I am not a Bitcoin maximalist. I am not an Ethereum maximalist. I am a maximalist for open, borderless, decentralized, permissionless systems that allow us to solve problems in society with technology that is open for everyone. I think that is a magical recipe. And it doesn't matter whether you tried to solve them in Ethereum or tried to solve them in Bitcoin or what you think Bitcoin is or what you think Ethereum is, because you don't get to decide. And even Vitalik doesn't get to decide. The market decides. And if you wanted a system where the founder decides, we already have those. They're called hierarchical institutions. Our society is run by them. If you want a system where there is no possibility for evolution into uncharted territory, there is no possibility for change with unintended consequences, then you appoint a dictator. They make all of the choices. Things are much more simple. The outcomes are predictable. Economic exclusion, human misery, poverty, the loss of freedom. Predictable outcomes, however. Some will benefit tremendously from these systems. But in engaging in this particular system, in signing up to play in the sandbox of Ethereum or Bitcoin, you are saying, I don't know what will happen because I'm not in charge. And even better, nobody knows what will happen because no one is in charge. Because these systems have been unleashed into a sea of creativity, where the market will decide what applications they think are best. And maybe it will work, and maybe it won't. And in the end, these things will fall into a niche where they fit perfectly for a very special set of applications. And we have no idea what these will be. Celebrate the line. Celebrate the shark. They're both kings of their own unique environmental niche. Thank you.